Hey folks, Randy Newberg here with another episode of Leupold's Hunt Talk Radio. Uh, today I have a great guest who I'm trying to remember how long it's been since he and I have tried to coordinate our calendars so that we could do a podcast together. Uh, he's a great guy. Most of you know him, Remy Warren. Uh, Remy previously did a TV show called Apex Predator. He does a ton of stuff with uh, The Solo Hunter. Uh, he's an occasional guest on the Meat Eater podcast. He's got a huge Instagram page. But a big part of why I want to talk to Remy is he reached out to me, I don't know, five or six years ago and said, Randy, I love all this self-guided public land hunting that you do. Uh, I, I want to show you or tell you how you can do it in other places besides just the United States. And Remy, has, I guess I'd call him the hunting adventurer. Uh, he's figured out how to do this same self-guided public land thing in other parts of the world. And we're going to talk about some of that today. Uh, going to talk about his background, how he got into hunting, uh, things he's up to. But before we do that, obviously, we want to talk about the great folks that make this podcast possible. Uh, we call it Leupold's Hunt Talk Radio for a reason, because Leupold is a huge supporter of everything that we do. They are so so supportive. Can't hardly thank them enough. And uh, they also make the best optics uh, that you can put on your rifle. Um, well, let's just say that if you're in the, in the market for optics, you need to be thinking about Leopold. Uh, I hope you will. Uh, their support for everything related to public lands and hunting is tremendous. And they make great products right there in Beaverton, Oregon. Also is Orion Coolers. Uh, Orion Coolers, it's that time of year to be using and buying coolers. Go to OrionCoolers.com and you'll learn why we use those coolers. Uh, we use them intensively. They fly with us where we go. We throw them in the back of the truck, in the trailers. We live out of them for months on end. Uh, use promo code RANDY when you go out there to OrionCoolers.com and you will get the chance to be the, the lucky recipient of a tumbler for, for just for using promo code Randy. So you'll get a great cooler, you'll get a great tumbler, and you'll have years and years and years of great use from the cooler that you buy, oriancoolers.com. Then we've got Onyx Maps. Right now, uh, we are doing an entire e-scouting series, uh, desk scouting, cyber scouting, whatever you want to call it. But it's all about e-scouting for elk on public land. And I think we're between episodes three and four right now out of about I th every every week we keep adding more episodes. So I think we're going to end up at about 12 or 13 episodes in this entire series. We release them every Monday. Uh, and you're going to see how we use this Onyx tool, why it's so critical to our, our scouting, and then so critical to our use out in the field. And uh, if you go to Onyx, maps.com and you use promo code randy r-a-n-d-y they're going to give you 20 percent off any of their app products and i think when you watch the e-scouting series you can watch it out on our youtube channel uh the youtube channel is randy newberg hunter uh you go out there and watch these uh, hopefully you'll find them valuable and go to onyxmaps.com and get the, the tools that we're using and save yourself 20%. And then we have Go Hunt. Uh, GoHunt.com is uh, the go to place that we use for doing all of our research, where we acquire our tags, uh, draw odds, uh, strategy articles, you name it, it's there. And right now, they have a 30 day free trial. So if you want to see what it is that we're using and, and get your chance to, to log in and get behind the scenes, I mean, to the real stuff, this insider that they have, that's the part of the, the service that's the most valuable. They're going to let you try it for 30 days free of charge. 
So go to gohunt.com uh, insider. And I think, I'm trying to remember, I, th- I think that they have a special page set up just for us, uh, forward slash Randy. Uh, but anyhow, try it. You'll like it. Uh, when your 30 days is up, I'm pretty sure you're going to say, man, I need to buy that uh, and go from there. So with that, as quick as I uh, get the the technology handle on here, uh, I'm going to turn it on and, and we're going to have Remy join us. Unfortunately, he and I are crossing paths here in Bozeman. We're both going separate directions. I wish that we could have about a two or three hour discussion. I think we got about an hour, hour and 15 minutes that we're able to, to visit. But uh, when I found out he's going to be in town, I said, you know what? I don't care if we both have tight windows here. I want to get Remy on the on the podcast. So with that, here we go, folks. Remy Warren is going to join us. And when we're all done, uh, I think that you're going to expand your horizons about where you're going to go and do some public land self-guided hunting. Here we go. Well, folks, I told you that we have like the LeBron James of the hunting world here with us. Um, I say that in a lot of respects in that he's like, that talented but also he's kind of like a free agent you never know he shows up on all these all-star teams you just never know where i'm going <laughs> yeah As I, I ask remy i'm like remy what what platforms you want me to promote and talk about and he's like mm, i don't know this one and that one and do you do you ever feel like a free agent like i, I mean i say that because right now it's free agent period for all the sports teams, right? And yeah. the big deal about LeBron James signing. Who did he end up signing with? I don't uh, even know. I, I think California somewhere. One of the LA teams yeah, probably. probably. Anyhow, so uh, right now people can find Remy Warren at the Solo Hunter platform, right? You, yep. and, you and Tim have the Amazon channel and the YouTube channel. Yep, and then uh, also... For people that want the this year's episodes that don't have the outdoor channel, you can get it on the solo all access. So you okay. can kind of sub, it's like a subscription thing, but you can get all the new stuff okay. when it comes out, like when we edit it actually. So before oh. the outdoor channel. Whoa. Which is pretty cool. Yeah, he must have I don't know how he pulled that one off with the network. They're usually not real fond of that kind of stuff. Uh, they, they, Tim just does what he wants. <laughs> <laughs> Good for Tim. Yeah. Uh, those of you who know Tim, he's a great guy. Uh, he films some really cool content, and you're you're not on all of them, uh, are you? I don't, no, I don't see you on all of his episodes. See no, you, so see you on quite a few. Of his them. episode, he has. We kind of split the episode, so he he does about half of them, and I do the other half. Yeah, but obviously, solo hunters, you, you one guy try to keep it one guy yeah there's a few random episodes that well one it's just because even if i'm not filming it for anything i still film it yeah just for my own personal use i've done that since i was i think 13 years old Whoa. um there was a hunt in alaska that i did with my dad it was a caribou hunt and it was just like i was going to turn it into it because normally i what i used to do when i was a kid is just film our hunts through the season and then for christmas i'd make them a little video so okay. i was just going to do the same thing cool. kind of a throwback of what i used to do <laughs> and it happened to be on a memory card that i gave tim with other episodes because i don't ever clear my memory cards i just kind of <laughs> film stuff on. i've got bad organization and oh. tim turned it into an episode and i was like and people loved that that was the like we got more response out of that episode with my dad than anything I've ever done. It was like it wasn't even filmed that well, I didn't think, but people loved it. So I did a couple others with him. Uh, I was like, well, might as well just keep filming our hunts together. And whether we use them for solo or not, doesn't matter. I just yeah, and it did an elk hunt last year and stuff with him. So it was it was pretty fun. Cool. Yeah. And occasionally I see you on or hear you pick you up on the Meat Eater podcast. Yep. Uh, Steve and those guys when I guess whenever they want to upgrade the talent they call you yeah exactly <laughs> weren't you weren't you on that crazy a uh, fog neck uh, yep, uh, yeah that, beat them off beat the brown bear off with a trekking pole yep elk that hunt? was uh, I was on that trip because I've I've hunted that island quite a few times and so I kind of decided I didn't really care if I shot another one yeah but Steve had never got uh, Roosevelt there yeah. so he's like oh we'll put in as a party since i'd been there okay you know the area pretty well and i was like yeah sounds good if we ever draw it i'll go again yeah um 
And then, yeah, and then he shot his bull and then we got attacked by the bear and then I didn't have any time to hunt. (laughs) I was like, let's go bow hunting now, guys. I was like, no, let's get out of here. (laughs) Yeah, well, Giannis living here in Bozeman, he and I have coffee like once a month. Oh, cool. And after he got back from that one, I'm like, is this for real, Giannis? And he told me the whole story, the the gory details of every oh, yeah. bit of it, kind of like you guys told on the podcast. And I said, well, now that you have a little time to reflect on it, what are your thoughts? He's like, I might have used my one mulligan, he said. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he was pretty tore up about it out there. He was, because like right afterwards, he was, he, yeah, he was definitely pretty tore up about it. He had a lot going through his mind for sure. Oh, I bet. It was a pretty, it was pretty scary. Yeah. No kidding. I mean, you think about something that big, pissed off, deciding, I'm going to come and show you guys whose tree this is. Yeah. The the thing that I didn't like about it was just how fast it happened and how our protection was just so f- inaccessible. Yeah. It just made you, it's just the thought of thinking, I'm going to die and I could have prevented this. That's the part that sucks. Yeah. <laughs> Getting attacked by the bear didn't suck. It was just the fact that you could have prevented the attack or whatever. I mean, it worked out how it worked out, uh, but I wouldn't ever throw that chance, like throw it to chance again yeah. <laughs> like that. Well, I don't know what episode number it is, but uh, if anyone gets a chance, they should go download that episode of the Meat Eater podcast and listen to it because it's just yeah, listening to it's pretty intense. Yeah. it's. Uh, but you travel so many places, Remy. I mean, it, I follow you on your Instagram page, which is what, at Remy? At Warren? Remy Warren. Yeah, two, just my Two name. R's, right? Uh, yep. <laughs> R-E-M-I-W-A-R-R-E-N. Yeah. Uh, you are in New Zealand and Australia and Alaska and Montana and Nevada and... You are the traveling, you, you are what everybody, everyone when they grow up wants to be Remy Warren. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> I don't know. I wanted to be me too. I was like, I thought when I started guiding, well, par, what got me to go other places was I just thought to myself, man, I want to do this year round. Yeah. Because I just oh, guided all fall. Okay. So that's kind of what got me into it is where, how can I hunt year round? Yeah. Because I thought about, oh, maybe I'll do fishing guiding, which I love fishing. Yeah. But I didn't really want a fishing guide until I exhausted all my hunting out of my legs and <laughs> knees and back. I was can like, I'll save I can, yeah, I can row when I'm older. <laughs> um, so when I was just after the guiding season in Montana and after I graduated from college, then I had the, the spring and s- summer mm-hmm. when I used to go to school off. Yeah. So I'm like, well, I need to work somehow. And I can't, I tr- I actually applied for jobs at Sportsman's Warehouse and Orvis and all these other places and got denied. <laughs> they wouldn't even, I couldn't even get a cashier job because I was, I was always honest. They're like, well, what, where do you see yourself, uh, you know, in the fall? And I was like, well, I'm going to be guiding in the fall, just so yeah. you know. I should have just lied. Uh, but I wanted to work somewhere like that where I could get an employee discount and get uh-huh. my gear cheaper right. and then go guide in the fall, but nobody would hire me. Like, oh. I tried like hell to, to get hired funny. somewhere. Um, yeah. <laughs> so so anyone who's been denied an applicate a job at a big box outdoor retailer. Yep. Just it, go just guide know around the world. <laughs> they're in the same camp as yep. as Remy Warren. Exactly. I was like, well, I can't get a job doing anything else and I need a seasonal job. So I'm just going to try to find guide work and hunt other places. Okay. And that's uh, when I started going to New Zealand. I don't even remember. Probably it was a long, not that long ago, but probably seven, eight years ago maybe. Mm-hmm. Um, I just bought a one-way ticket and... Flew over there and figured it out and stayed the exact number of days for my visa and then flew home and was like, okay, I kind of got this figured out and then applied for a year-long visa there and stuff and okay. kept going back and it was, yeah, loved huh. it. And then from there, I kind of ventured over to Australia and um, did some hunting in Hawaii, all that South Pacific stuff. I, I love hunting in the South Pacific. It's uh-huh. because it's opposite seasons and they've just got so many different species and it's so wide open and a lot of opportunity and a lot of adventure. Yeah. It's really cool. Uh, there, we have this web form called hunttalk.com and we have a bunch of Kiwis, New oh, Zealanders yeah. out there and a bunch of them invite me to come over and hunt there. They said, well, 
for what you do, this whole public land self-guided thing, you can come here to New Zealand and do it. I'm like, well, wait a second, what are, you, what are you talking about? Yeah. They're like, no, yeah. uh, and maybe I got this wrong. They said, you don't even buy a tag. Nope, you, no tags. You just come and you go and there's all this public land there. Yeah, there's a ton of it. That There is, you don't have to get a tag, but you just get a free online like permit that says where you're going to be, uh -huh. but that's it. Uh, no paid licenses, nothing like that. Now, if you hunted on private or something, you'd have to pay the landowner right. or whatever you work it out with them. That's a different deal. But yeah, there's public land all over the place. That's why I started going there. I was like looking into it and I thought, man, I've never heard of anyone doing DIY New Zealand hunting, really. Right. But I mean, this was seven, eight, nine years ago, right. whatever. No you didn't one really hear about that. it. So I thought, yeah. and I started you know, looking into it. I'm like, I think I can do this. And then I just went over there and was like, oh, I, I, I showed up, I bought a car and started <laughs> cruising. Actually, it took me a while to get a car. So I, I ended up staying in some guy's cottage with no vehicle. Um, it's kind of a weird deal. I got dropped off and then someone was going to come pick me up where I could go get a vehicle. Uh -huh. But he never showed back up. <laughs> <laughs> so I was in this cottage for three, four days. My friend Bart was over with me. And we had no food and had no clue where town was. Oh my goodness. This was just like, we just kind of showed up. And it was a ways. It was, I think it was like a 15, 20 mile walk to town. Oh my God. And we're like, oh, I think this guy's going to show back up. Uh, we can go pick that car up. And no one showed up, no one showed up. And there was this <laughs> apple tree outside the house. And that was all we had to eat. <laughs> I think it was like almost going on a week. We we're just living off apples. <laughs> and then we're, I, we figured, we, there was a thing of honey in the cottage. It's it pretty old. And then there's honey and some sugar and a few other random things. We had, we just cook apples every way you could find apples. <laughs> and then one day the owner of the property is like, man, those guys really like apples. And he came over, he's like, what are you, you guys uh, really like apples? And we're like, oh, we have nothing else to eat. He's like, oh, hey, why don't you come over to my house? We'll fix you dinner and get you all set up. He felt bad for us. Well, I'd funny. like apples too, if that's all there was. Yeah, too. but when you eat apples oh. for an entire week, I haven't eaten an apple since. <laughs> <laughs> Your stomach will never like, be yeah. the same. Yeah, and then I got a vehicle and then it was on from there. But yeah. it was a How weird, long were you over there on that first trip? Uh, uh, three months. Three months. Yeah. Wow. Cool. Yeah. And then I kind of so. found a bunch of different places to hunt, just looking online and maps and talking to people and mm -hmm. just would go canyon to canyon to canyon exploring and finding the places I liked the most and mostly liked hunting the tar the best. Yeah. Uh, tar and shiami. Just because they're such tough, yeah. extreme kind of... High alpine stuff. Yeah. It's like you get to go on a doll sheep hunt every day for three months kind wow. of thing, you know, or mountain goat or whatever. Yeah. Plus for the public land stuff, it's the most realistic opportunity at a trophy. Because mm -hmm. like the red deer, uh, the public land hunting forum's not that, I mean, it's good, but it's, you know, everybody sees these giant right. red deer and that's just not. Not what, what you're going to see on public. No. Uh, um, the so selective liked, breeding on the private ranches are yeah. playing a little part in how big those exactly. red stags get. Yeah, the only reason they're so big is because the uh, ant they, they those deer are just grown for their antlers for uh, herbal medicine and stuff. Oh, really? So that's why they oh. they've made them bigger for that and then for meat because okay. you get paid per pound. So they just started breeding them up because when you sell them off for meat, the bigger the hinds, you get more money. Right. And then you get more money because they pay per kilo for the cut off velveted antlers. So right. you might as well breed them up to yeah. be these monst monstrosities. <laughs> <laughs> they were actually never bred up for hunting. Okay. And then someone's like, hey, these things are pretty big. We could shoot these and sell them. <laughs> That's how that all got started. Uh, but a, a regular red deer doesn't look anything like that. Okay. Yeah. So you did New Zealand, and then you expanded to Australia. Yeah. Is Australia somewhat like New Zealand in that you don't need, it's kind of a go find it and have at it? Or it's a little bit different. It's not as much public land. Okay. Not as much opportunity as far as like public hunting goes. Um, there it's just, I've met people in, in New Zealand hunting that happen to be from Australia and they're like, oh, here I can set you up with this guy who knows guy. 
and uh-huh. get permission. Some of the stuff there, like you have to have, you have to have permission on most everything. I mean, yeah. there is public land stuff in like Victoria and other places, but um, for the most part, it's on these really large stations. Okay. And sometimes you when know, they say station, it's like that? a ranch. Oh, gotcha. But it might be. It it's almost. I think some of them are. Some of it's privately held, and some of it's just leased from different. It might be leased from like a tribal community or whatever, or mm-hmm. maybe even some government land, but not really public access. But some of them are like can be nine hundred thousand acres. Wow! It might take almost a day to drive across the thing. So wow. yeah, there's there's some big, big places. <laughs> I don't think people realize how big mm-hmm. Australia is. Yeah, it's the size of it's larger than the U.S. With no one, <laughs> I mean, people in the major cities, right? And then there might not you could drive three hundred miles without hitting a gas station. Yeah, really, it's, it's very similar to as remote as Alaska. I think it's the most, in my opinion, Australia is the most remote country in the world as far as just like proximity to places. You yeah. could drive thirteen, fourteen hours, eight hundred miles, something like that, and and not even hit a town kind of thing. Huh. It's pretty, it's pretty incredible. I, Very large tracts of wilderness. I never thought about Australia in that context. I've always thought of it as Sydney and, yeah. you know. The, well, you think you like that. fly from Sydney to Darwin is a, in a plane I think is six hours, seven hours, something like that. Yeah. Holy smoke. Yeah. And there's nothing in between the two. So imagine driving that. <laughs> it's like driving from California to Maine and not hitting a city. <laughs> You know? <laughs> wow. Yeah, you've got like little, oh. I mean, you've got little like Montana sized, like 1,500 people type towns, but not much else in between. Yeah. It's pretty crazy. Huh. Wow. Yeah. Never, I, I, I've i never thought of Australia in that context. That would be, yeah. That, that would be full of adventure, it seems like. It, I think, so. I mean, the thing about it is, I could be wrong, but it, it seems to have some of the largest wilderness areas out of anywhere. Really? You just go forever. And, uh, no uh, roads, nothing. So when you go there and you get to these wilderness areas, is it, uh, again, you, you're kind of trying to sort out, can I hunt here, can I not hunt here sort of thing? <sighs> yeah, I think most of it there is you kind of know, okay, this is, the, you kind of know this general areas where I can hunt and it's so large like you'll never find the end of it type deal. <laughs> like you just go to the middle and you can do <laughs> go wherever. Huh. Um, and what are you hunting there? Uh, I'm actually going this week uh, to hunt Moloccan Rusa and maybe wild pigs and scrub bulls but mostly I'm going there for the Rusa. Rusa, how do you spell that? R-U-S-A. R-U-S-A. Yeah. And they're like a deer of some sort? Yep. It's, uh, it's a species of deer. They're, they're kind of like... Uh, now I'll probably I'm going to try to explain a deer by saying other obscure deer. <laughs> uh, I'll start with like something very known. I guess it'd be imagine a miniature elk. Okay, but dark brown color and only grows three points on its antlers. Okay, so wow. brows and then a one point up the main beam huh. and on the outside. Yeah. Wow, and th- I'd say like so. A Moloccan rusa is a little bit smaller antlers than the Javan rusa. There's a couple subspecies. Okay, um, but the 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 G- the Moloccan rusa, like a good one, would be a 30 inch antler. Gotcha. Um, 30 inch beam, hmm. and then but you, probably more in the 25 to 28 inch range. Very similar yeah. to like the size of an axis deer. Okay, just not spotted. Just so brown. will this be rifle or archery hunting? Uh, archery. Okay. Yeah, because you can't really get guns into Australia very easily. Oh, okay. So it's primarily everything I've done there has been archery. Archery. Uh, oh. So you go down and do that stuff, then you'll be back up to the northern latitudes. Yep. Starting. Two days before antelope season starts. <laughs> just pack up my stuff and head head to northern Nevada. I drew an antelope tag out there. Oh, you did? Yeah. Cool. And then, yeah. and then uh, I drew a mule deer tag as well. So. Okay. Being a resident, you get the inside track on yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. I've been so lucky in Nevada. People think I must be paying them off or yeah. something. I drew an antelope tag on the Sheldon up north. Okay. Um, I've drawn, I don't know how many deer tags, lots. I drew elk. 
Uh, I just got off the out of the penalty box for elk. Oh, nice. Um, so not that I expect I'll draw again in my lifetime because of how hard it is for yeah. a non-resident to draw in Nevada. But It's pretty hard for residents as well. It's not yeah. an easy tag to draw. My dad just drew his second... My dad just drew his second Nevada bull tag. He had a rifle tag, and he just drew uh, what I consider probably the best tag in the state. Oh, cool! Early archery, you know, archery hunt. Yeah. Um, and he only had he he drawn. I think he had six or seven points built up again. So okay, he got pretty lucky. But yeah, I'm excited about that. <laughs> yeah. be a cool tag. He, he's really excited about it. Yeah. Well, the fun of hunting Nevada is. They manage for a high quality experience for every species. Yeah. At my experience, I last year I drew a deer tag and it was a really easy deer tag to draw. It was archery. And everyone's like, oh, why'd you put in for that? I went there and had more fun and saw more bucks every day on public land than I would see in Montana. Oh, yeah. There's any unit in Nevada. I've always said this, but any unit in Nevada can have a Boone and Crockett buck in it. Yeah. It's not, I don't think there's, I really don't think there's any other state where you can go to any unit and have a decent opportunity. And especially if you're a bow hunter, there's like Pope and Young bucks around every corner. <laughs> but they aren't, it, the hunting's different than other places too. It's a lot more difficult to actually be successful. Right. I think. Yeah, I like, prove that every time I go there. Yeah. It's, it's, I think it's, <laughs> it's the easiest place to not the easiest place it's a place where there's a lot of deer and there's good deer but i think out of every state in the west it's the hardest state to kill a deer yeah maybe arizona's probably can be difficult as well but you can hunt them during the rut with yeah. the bow so yeah i don't know well i enjoy it i didn't draw this year unfortunately oh uh, so you'll do all that nevada hunting and then are you still doing some stuff in montana or are you kind of yeah, no, I still be in Montana. Do you? Yep. Yeah, okay. the full, pretty much the full season. Um, archery and rifle. Okay. Uh, and we run hunters, but it's like one of those things I don't like to talk about too much because we're so full up. Like I just can't get, right. you know. You don't need the world. People like, hey, I want to book a hunt. I heard you here. And I was like, this, I'm sorry, <laughs> but I won't ever get to those emails just because we get a lot of them. And, yeah. But I do, here, I'll just say this because people... If you want to go on a guided hunt in Montana with me, go to our website, get our email, compose your own email, and in the uh, subject line, put the word wait list, your name, and in the body, put what you want to hunt, what weapon, and how many people. Because anytime we have an opening, I just go to my email and I type the word wait list and anybody that pops up, then I just call them. And sometimes it's a guy that just sent an email like, right. yeah, He's my like, wait list is like not real <laughs> legit. That's just how it works. <laughs> so if you do that, there's a very good chance that you can go hunting with us. But outside of that, it's just repeat clients yeah. and we just try to keep it easy that way. Yeah. Now but, it's amazing how many referrals I make to outfitters because a lot of people watch our stuff or listen to our stuff and they're like, you know, I live in wherever. I live in South Carolina. I I can't come out here and pull it off. Yeah. I have my work, my family, I've got this much time. So in every state I've got this list of guys I know who they run really good outfits. They're going to have a great time. And it's not necessarily about how big of an animal I think someone's going to shoot with that outfitter as it is are they going to have a good experience yeah and so well now i know not to send them to you remy yeah well you uh, can you can send them to the wait list <laughs> that's i mean it's a good place to be if you're an outfitter yeah but we've been i mean i we've had that wait list since they're not the wait list but we've been booked up pretty much since i started um yeah. outfitting i started outfitting probably i guess it'd be I don't know when I started my own. I'd have to think about it for <laughs> over 10 years now. Yeah. So, huh. and then been guiding ever since I was so, 18. So with that work requirement, uh, you get to do any of your own hunting other than what you have in Nevada? Um, yeah, well, I, I got a, uh, I'm going on a doll sheep hunt. So oh, well. I drew a special tag, cool. archery tag, archery only. Ooh, wow. But you can hunt, you can shoot any ram. 
Oh, so okay. it makes it nice. Yeah. Because you don't have, sometimes even in really good areas, the trouble is just finding a legal ram. Yeah. But if, so if you've got your bow, you got to first find a legal ram and then you've got to try to stock it here. Yeah. You could, there's mature rams that you can stock, even though they aren't legal, like six year old, seven year old rams. Yeah. But huh. it might not be full curl or whatever. So you can pretty much have a better chance of getting a, sh an opportunity at a sheep because yeah. you can hunt any ram. Yeah. So will that be in August? Uh, no, that's September. September? September oh, okay. Yeah. So huh. the first part of September and then yeah. I'll come back and start dating. Yeah. Well, some people uh, <clears throat> followed my, uh, I can't remember it was on Instagram, I think it was, that I drew an archery bison tag in Utah for this year. Yeah, that's that's exciting. Yeah. yeah. And someone's like, hey, Remy Warren said he's coming with you. I'm like, he did? Uh, I didn't see that. <laughs> I think it was like, you took my tag. If you need help packing, let oh, me know. <laughs> okay. So uh, the odds are as uh, below average as my talent is, Remy, I'm not going to need any help packing. Yeah. <laughs> but no, I'm excited about that one. I've been applying for bison in Utah for, well, I had 19 points. So obviously yeah. I'd flunked out at least 19 times. Yeah. And uh, I'd been lucky I drew a bison a bull or any any bison tag here in Montana in 2013 and shot a bull and then I had a cow tag in Wyoming in 2015 I think 16 15 slash 16 and uh it was harder to find a cow than it was I couldn't believe how crazy hard it really? was because it was it wasn't a hard winter and they'd had a really moist summer. So in Wyoming, how it works is the the bison migrate south out of uh, Grand Teton National Park and they end up on the ja outside of Jackson is the National right. Elk Refuge. So you can hunt the elk refuge. Well, the locals have got it figured out. Once a herd comes across the Grove Hunt River. They're they're right there. It's like, hey, they came across tonight. So they're all there hunting. And when they start shooting, the bison are like, oh, this, this is hard on longevity. We're going back to the park. So they quickly figure out where that park line is. <clears throat> and uh, I ended up not filling that tag. I went down there four different times. And really? every time it was the, oh, you should have been here yesterday. Huh. <laughs> Walking around and gut piles all over. It's like, dang, dang you're right. I should have been here yesterday. But man, bison hunting is, it's fun. It's got this historical nostalgia kind of feel. And then just the meat is spectacular. Yeah, it's hard to beat bison burgers and yeah, big roasts and yeah. all that good stuff. I've yet to draw a bison tag. I've put in a lot of places for a long time. Yeah. But my brother might get a Montana tag this year because he's on Ooh. the list, but he's number thirteen. So for the all, the cow, the cow, cow yeah. list. cool. So well, he hopefully. should get called. They usually call. It says they say fifty. 50 some. Up, yeah. yeah. Huh. And is he on the West Yellowstone or the Gardner? You um, know, I can't remember. I think he's on the West Yellowstone. Okay, I'm not sure though. Yeah. Well, hopefully they get a harsh winter and yeah. uh, forces them to to be come cool. out. It'd be a lot of fun. So we're we're kind of lucky to get to do the things we do. Oh, really lucky? Yeah. yeah. I a lot of people are like, "How do you end up being able to do this?" Well, I uh, it was I can't say it was a plan, but it was kind of a plan. Yeah. Uh, kind of like you're saying that your uh, wait list isn't necessarily legit. My plan wasn't necessarily legit, but. It was a plan, and the plan was someday I didn't want to have to be tied to a desk. And so I became a CPA, tax accountant, disinherit the federal treasury, and even when I was getting into that, I'm doing the math on the calendar. I'm like, all right, really busy from December 1st to April 15th, and then nobody even cares where you're at until after Thanksgiving. Right. That sounds like the schedule I want to have. And so that's what I did. And uh, it's worked out really good for getting to hunt and fish a lot. That's awesome. Yeah. And uh, so I, I can't say that I ever planned on having podcasts and video channels and stuff like that. That was all by accident. Uh, but it it's a good gig. I, I think uh, sometimes though, when you just start doing what you love to do, then mm -hmm. everything else just kind of figures its way out. You kind of work into it. 
Yep. I mean, I, I kind of created a plan for myself. I knew pretty much from a young age what I wanted to do. And that's all I focused on. But right. I also didn't give myself any other option to do right. anything different. Like I started guiding and then I and and then I filmed every then when I started filming, obviously none of the, there wasn't YouTube, there wasn't any yeah. there was no outlets for stuff. Mm-hmm. There wasn't even outdoor channel, I don't think. No, there wasn't. And I definitely didn't have it if there was. <laughs> um, but, you know, I just filmed it because, well, there's DVDs. That was the thing. So right. I just make my own little DVDs, <laughs> sell them on the street corner. <laughs> oh. um, yeah. And then just kind of worked into the other stuff, all the other stuff. But I really didn't give myself any other options to do anything different. Yeah. I'd- Except for that time that I tried to get a job at Sportsman's Warehouse. <laughs> 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 oh. Well, you grew up in Reno area, right? Yep. And yep. with all the public land in Nevada, I don't think it's, I think a lot of listeners feel they think of Nevada as Vegas, yeah. and they don't realize what an amazing opportunity exists in Nevada. No, for someone who likes to hunt. Well, it's you've never been told when you grow up your entire life, never being told you can't go somewhere. You just every every anywhere you want to go in Nevada, you can go. Right. And even if it's private. Up and you, as long as it's not posted, you could yeah. just go on it. And most like native Nevadans who own pieces of land, yeah, don't care if you go on their property, but their property isn't any like private property there isn't any better than public property. It's right. just somebody yeah. just happens to own a chunk of land that you just drive <laughs> through and go to the mountain back there because, yeah, it's open, it's yeah. nice, it's a good feeling. It's weird to. When I started hunting in Montana with my grandpa and having to be like, well, that's private and you got to know where you're at before there was... Remember the time when you had to know how to read a map and know where you are based on the map and there was all these (laughs) loose interpretations of whether you're on the right place or not? Uh, It was really very confusing. (laughs) You're like, well, let's just... But you would stay away from anywhere that was even questionable. And you just go like, okay, this for sure is good. Yeah, it was the weirdest concept though from someone that lives in Nevada. Like, what, you have to ask permission to go on. This is weird. Why would you have to ask permission? <laughs> this is dumb. <laughs> Who invented this system? <laughs> you got to know where you're at. This is terrible. Uh, yeah. But, well, it's I, I. The reason that I bring it up is because I went to college there for six years, and it really that is when my eyes opened to what the West had. To oh, yeah. offer because I grew up in northern Minnesota in the confines of, you know, the big swamps and stuff. And it, it was fun hunting and fishing there, but all of a sudden it's like, holy cow, I can go do this. Look at all this public land. I, you mean I don't got to win the lottery to go yeah. on this hunt? <laughs> and uh, then uh, I was living in Carson City working in Reno. My wife and I got married and uh, we came here to Bozeman for our honeymoon. Oh, cool. Uh, yeah. And uh, we, we were here for about 10 days. And before we left, she's like, I'm moving here. I'm like, yes. I love this <laughs> woman. I knew I married the right woman. Uh, and the pay cuts we took to come here were just so crazy. But it was what we wanted to do. Back to your point, we didn't give ourselves any other option. Yeah, We said, awesome. you know what? This is going to, we're just going and we're going to figure it out. We're going to make it work. And you do, you figure it out. I would imagine coming from uh, Minnesota or Michigan or anywhere or just even Texas or something and then going to Nevada, I feel like the first few years you'd constantly feel like you're doing something illegal. Right. <laughs> you're just like, wait, is this, you're serious? Like that good, that spot, or you find a spot with a lot of deer, you're like, wait, this has to be illegal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it, while I was going to college, I trapped a lot of bobcats and hunted a lot of coyotes because they were worth a pot full of money. Oh yeah. I could wake, make way more money trapping and, and hunting for than I made at the sawmill where my part-time job was, well, full-time job was down in Gardnerville. And I would find all these places with all these bobcats. I'm like, am, uh, are these like the king's bobcats? Uh, am I going to get my arm chopped off yeah. or something? I'm like, nope, just go. Go I'm for like, it. Whoa, this is so cool. Yeah, that's pretty so, awesome. So it kind of spoils you. And, and then you travel to so many places. Me, I'm like this domesticated U.S. hunter, but even in the U.S., I travel to places where it's like, man, 
I'm really glad to live in the West where I do with all this public land because I, I'd have a hard time being confined the way that you can get confined in other places. Oh, definitely. Yeah, we're spoiled. It's you couldn't once you're here. You, you, I couldn't ever go anywhere else. Yeah, really. Yeah, uh, just the access and just being able to do what you want and and have such good hunting without having to ask permission or pay for it. It's like yeah. it's, it's it's just it's pretty cool. Yeah. So, did you grow up from like when you were a kid? You were hunting. Yeah. 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 My dad uh, took me hunting when I was a kid. Just I was just obsessed with it. Yeah, and that's all I could think about from the time I could think. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, my dad liked to hunt, but I, he he learned to really love to hunt because I loved it so much. Okay. I think. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's cool. He's more of just you know he's more of just like a weekend hunter kind of hobby hunter. Yep. And then it, like as I got into it, I got so into it that it just became lifestyle hunter. <laughs> yeah. 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 My dad loved, he lived for white tailed deer hunting and he did bear baiting for guys, but for him, he, he had a drinking problem, but he could sober up a little bit for white tail season. Yeah. And that's what he lived for. He, this is so weird. I, my parents divorced when I was 11 and it was not necessarily the prettiest divorce. Uh, so I didn't get, my dad and I didn't have the greatest relationship, but it used to piss me off because in hunting season, he would go around any kid in town who didn't have someone to take him hunting. He'd throw him in the van. He'd be drumming up this old bolt action 30-30 and this, you know, every kind of offbeat brand of rifle and ammunition. And he'd take the kids out and they had to build their own tree stand, the kind that you'd fall, you know, they yeah. fall apart and you break your neck. And that, that was the kind of stands my dad uh, excelled <laughs> at. So it would make me mad because it's like, this is when I'm supposed to be spending time with my dad and there's 12 other kids with us. <laughs> what the heck is up with that? And uh, it wasn't until I got older that I understood the method to his madness. He, hunting meant that much to him that he wanted every kid to have a chance to go hunting. And now I go back to this little town and the number of kids, the number of guys my age who will stop me and say, hey, you know, that if it wasn't for your old man, I would have never got into hunting. And that makes me feel really, really good. It's a cool feeling. Even though at the time, man, it pissed yeah, me off. That's cool. I, I used to hate half those kids. I'm like, <laughs> get the hell out. I'd, I'd find reasons to that they shouldn't be able to come with us. Hey, dad, that guy, I think he's smoking dope, man. We can't bring him with. <laughs> he's like, well, we're bringing him with. <laughs> so I, for my dad, that was the one part of his world was white-tailed deer hunting the first week in November, first two weeks in November. That's when his life once again seemed to be back in, in line. And uh, I think that's part of where my hunting passion came from is it was a time when my dad and I could take a break from what was a pretty stressful relationship to hunting was the time when we just had a good time and we didn't give a damn about the rest of the world. That's cool. So, And from there on, it was just, I wanted this lifestyle hunting, as you call it. Yeah. It's... I, I scratch my head and try to think about what would I do if I couldn't hunt as much as I do? Golf? Uh, I don't know. I, fish. <laughs> well, I fish a little bit. I mean, my wife forces me to fish. But, man, I, I'd be ornery. Yeah. <laughs> my wife, will, actually, when I get back off the road every year, uh, I'm home and I can tell I'm getting on my wife's nerves. And I don't know if it's because she's just, you know, the reacclimation process or because I'm not hunting, I'm kind of edgy. So after about three or four days of me being back home, she'll look at me and say, don't you and your buddies have someplace you can go for a few days? We, you know, let's ease back into this because right now you're not any fun to be around. So I don't know, maybe that's just the nature of who I am. That when I'm not hunting, not thinking about hunting, not planning hunting, I'm just like a crotchety old guy. I'm like Archie Bunker or something. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, so of all the places you go to, all the things you do, is there some place that just draws you and keeps you mm -hmm. excited, 
that I want to go do that every year until I can't do it anymore. Uh, I mean, definitely early season Nevada mule deer hunting is one of those things for me. Yeah. Uh, archery hunting and then uh, tar hunting in New Zealand is one of those things. Yeah. Just kind of have to go back every year and huh. go on my tar hunt. Yeah. Uh, so when you're tar hunting, uh, what's the vertical change from, all right, we're starting out at 4,000, but the tar are up at eight are they at five i mean yeah like here when you're hunting mule deer in the bridgers right here out of bozeman i say that because i have the limited entry tag this year i my elevation change in a day is going to be you know two thousand to three thousand thirty five hundred feet yeah it just depends sometimes i'd say like you might start at 1200 and shoot them at 6200 so about 5000 feet oh that's pretty steep yeah ground. yeah it, over the course of say a mile and a half <laughs> yeah <laughs> like, it's really steep <laughs> that's a yeah oh it's, man I mean, there's some places you go it's just it, it's literally straight up and down you're you're it's four points of contact climbing up to the top that's it's not for crazy. an old guy like me. No, but there's, I mean, there's not everywhere is hard like that. It just depends where you go. I generally drive my truck in and then hike and then and you hike up the valleys and you can get them in the valley. You can get them halfway up. That's just, sometimes you'll spot from the valley and they'll be up at the top and then you just go make your stock. But you pretty much spot them in the morning, watch where they go up. Then you go to where they're feeding in the morning. So you got all day to get there. Gotcha. And then you try to shoot them as early as you can. And then so you can get out in the daylight because yeah. it's really hard to get out in the dark. No kidding. Or sometimes you just sit there and just wait for it to get light again. But Wow. And you're fun. doing this archery? Yeah, I've done an archery. I like to rifle hunt it too. It just yeah. depends. Um, I'll do an archery hunt and a rifle hunt, both. Huh. Uh, so tar, most of these species in New Zealand are not native species, correct? All of them, yeah. Right. There's no so, native like mammals really. Where are tar from originally? The Himalayas. Himalayas? Yeah. So okay. they live around like Nepal, um, Mount Everest. They live on Everest, yeah. really. Huh. Their predators there are just snow leopards. Okay. But uh, those, and then the chamois are from Europe, yeah. the Alps. And and then the, the red deer you know, have pretty much come from Europe and the fallow deer from Europe. Yeah. And then there's just feral goats and pigs and feral sheep. Oh, really? Yeah. Huh. Just go after them. Yeah. I, I saw there. So we had a tag outside of Ely, Nevada in 19, or in 2016. And there was a feral domestic, formerly domestic ram, woolly boy oh, yeah. there. He was in the worst, ugliest, nastiest spot. He had so much fur and and wool on him. I don't know what the deal is. If if I mean there wasn't another sheep for anywhere. He's up on top of this big rock every day up there just just hanging out. Yeah. I'm like, I wonder if you could go shoot that thing. <laughs> I, probably. <laughs> I mean, was anyone getting like what what at, well cuz you know they just open graze all the sheep. In, in Nevada. It? Oh, right. Yeah. yeah. So it's just one of those. It's just a ram that just never got rounded up. Yeah. I don't know what the rules are, but yeah. it probably wouldn't be a bad idea to just shoot them because they're up in somewhere that's probably going to interact with, with wild. wild sheep populations. Yeah. That's what was going I'm through not, my head. Now, let's but. just say, I, I mean, I might not be the one promoting that. <laughs> 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 just, if, there, if somebody runs into you, you just buy it off of them. I don't yeah. know. I don't well, really know. You can call BLM and figure out what the rule is on that. Yeah. If anyone wants to know, I can give you the coordinates of yeah. where that ram was. There, yeah. Maybe something that got him by now, but he was big. I, I think it was part of it just because he's so wooled out. But yeah. It looked like he was comfortable just making a living up there. You'd think it'd be an easy snack for the mountain lions that cruise around in there. There's yeah. so many predators. You'd think that they wouldn't last that long. But yeah. Every once in a while you get surprised. Yeah. Maybe he's just ornery enough to yeah. to get through it. But no, that was a fun hunt. Uh me and my son and my buddy Mike Spitzer, we drew uh one of the late rifle tags there for November. Oh and cool. That's when you really get to see what Nevada has to offer. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> you had you had the, the late rifle hunt yeah. in Ely? Yeah. 
Yeah, that's cold. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. It definitely yeah. is really cold. Yeah. It was. It was. I, well, I'll never draw it again because that was so lucky to draw that tag. Yeah. Did you end up but, getting a bull on that hunt? Uh, that was a, a mule deer. Oh, mule deer. Oh, yeah. okay. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. No, I. Uh, I'd love so on that hunt. Boy, did we see some nice elk. Yeah. Whew. Needless to say, that's where I apply. My son has 17 Nevada elk points, so maybe he'll draw someday. Wow. But even as a non-resident, 17 doesn't necessarily get you that far ahead of the yeah. pack. But you could, that's the nice thing about it is somebody could draw with one point <laughs> or, or 17. Yeah. It's kind of. Yeah, well, he used up all his luck. He drew Montana moose last year. Uh, he drew a really good Wyoming elk this year, so. And, uh guy's got a horseshoe planted somewhere that yeah but well, i'm i'm not gonna say anything because this year i'm sitting on that utah bison tag my bridger buck tag a colorado archery mule deer tag uh new mexico archery elk tag so i'm pretty, pretty good sitting yeah pretty yeah but when you carpet bomb the entire west as my one friend calls it you occasionally have some years where you you get a few tags. Yeah. And then there's, even with that though, there's some years it's like, dang, I didn't draw anything. I better start calling my buddies to see if we can impose on them. Yeah. Well, so. I, Idaho draw results for it. Yeah, did came you draw? Out today. I can't, fi- I don't know my passcode. I'm pretty sure I didn't set up a user account. Oh. It's kind of, a, it seems like a new system. It is. And I apparently did, but I don't remember and they won't email me my info. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure the system's like, down on just uh, fry. Probably. I don't know what's going on, but I couldn't check. My friends are a good deer tag, but. Oh, cool. Yeah. No, I did uh, moose again in Idaho, so that kind of disqualifies me right. from the deer, elk, and antelope thing. But I uh, I don't know. I A lot of Idaho guys give me a hard time because I don't hunt there much. But when we're trying to plan content, I can't wait until what's today, July 6th, yeah. to find out if I did or didn't draw. I I have to be applying in every state along the way, trying to get tags for me and the guest hunters. And so usually by the time Idaho comes along, we've already got our tags. And, and already our, got season filled. Yeah. yeah. And so we look at Idaho and, and for those in our group who do apply for deer, elk, and antelope, it's like, all right, swing for the fences. Yeah. Because we're... we're we already have the schedule set. Yeah, we'll drop this hunt or move it around to accommodate like a really great late Idaho deer hunt, you know, yeah. like, so, down in the Hawaii or something. But other than that, I, it just, I don't know that we'll get around to hunt in Idaho much. It's too bad. It's such a cool place. Yeah. There's a lot of good opportunity there. Yeah. I won't talk too much about it because then everyone from Idaho is like, stop giving away the secrets. <laughs> <laughs> do you ever get, do you and Tim ever get grief about that? That you go someplace and people are like, why are you here? Why, why are you telling people about this? Uh, no, not really. Uh, I, I, we, I don't really say everywhere I'm at. Yeah. I try to refrain. There's yeah. a few times where we've been hunting and Tim's actually even said the wrong state. So I'm like, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> so we, funny. <laughs> we get grief about it quite a bit. Uh, but the, the part I always caution folks is like using Bozeman here. If we hunt out of Bozeman, I will go put some footage of the Bridgers, which is north of town, with some footage of the Spanish Peaks, which is southwest of town, with some footage of the Boulder River, which is way east of town. And we might not even be in any of those spots. And people will come up to me, man, I know exactly where you were at, man. I, I shot a bear there too. I'm like... Yeah, yeah. Keep thinking yeah. that. <laughs> I the one funny thing is I had I did a thing with Under Armour, yeah. uh, like a a moose hunt. Yeah, and the guys that were filming wanted a map shot, and I was like, I don't. I'm like one. I'm you aren't getting a map shot, right? And uh, and they're like, oh, well, we need something. And I'm like, well, so I looked in my buddy's truck, and there was like a a, a flight. Like a plane, uh, a, uh, um, uh, aerial. Yeah, yeah. it was like a, a flight navigation yeah. map <laughs> for an area that 
wasn't even remotely close to where I was at. Like just, I don't even know. It was just a completely random map. And I just, we just like, I just started pointing these places. And then someone like messaged me like, hey man, just to let you know, we zoomed in and saw where you're at and we're going to be hunting there next year. <laughs> it's the dumbest thing. <laughs> okay. Good luck. Uh, well, that cuts your scouting down yeah, a lot. If you exactly. Can, can. It's just a completely random map that I grabbed out of some dude's <laughs> truck to point at a random place that was probably 800 miles away. I don't even know if there's moose in that area. Yeah. In our old show, On Your Own Adventures, we used to oftentimes make it look like we are putting Latin lawn coordinates. And I, I never really paid any attention, but the editor put them in some place out in the Pacific Ocean. Yeah. And some guy's like, that is so much BS. The, I went and looked that up. You weren't hunting there. That's out in the Pacific Ocean. I'm like... <laughs> Well, what do you think I'm going to do? Say, all right, here's a pin. Come, come here. <laughs> so, oh well, yeah. But well, one other place where our paths cross, I mean, is uh, Gerber. Yeah. Um, we, uh, I think, last fall we were trying to do something with the Gerber folks, uh, but they got busy and it, it didn't work out to do a podcast. And I think they were over. They were somewhere over with you. I think over in Western Montana. Were yeah, they hunting they're with you somewhere. Right? Uh, just taking just, some photos and some okay. other things, yeah. Okay. And uh, actually, they're coming, a couple of them are coming to town on Tuesday. Oh, cool. And uh, they're going to, I think they're going to do a background check to see if this Newberg guy is really what he presents himself to be or is Good. he <laughs> is he like some sort of shyster that mm, we don't know if we want to associate with him. You can so. put me on the character reference list. <laughs> 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 uh, but... They, uh, they're they now, uh, in addition to being involved in all of our platforms here, Corey Jacobson and I just started a podcast that we launched today. Oh, cool. Called Elk Talk, and uh, Gerber is part of that. Oh, sweet. So, yeah, they're, we're uh, trying to figure out more and more Gerber applications for elk hunting, and that's part of what their guys are coming over for. Is for the last couple of years, I've been pitching them on all these ideas, and I think they've had to weed it out. Like, does Newberg really even gut and gill any elk, or what, yeah. <laughs> what's the deal? I think I detect BS there, but hopefully, I've convinced them that uh, I I do get to. Uh, I guess employ their devices occasionally throughout awesome. a season. Yeah, it's, it's good. It's one of my favorite things to do. A lot of people, when they watch our content, they're like, "Why are you always doing the gutting and gilling?" And that's the deal I make with every guest hunter because I love it. Yeah. Processing both in the field and at home is something that I just I love doing it. So I tell the guest hunters, "Look." You get first shot or, you, you know, maybe they are the only one with a tag. But when that animal hits the ground, get out of the way. You got to let me do the gutting and gilling. You're in it. Yeah. And they're like, you are right, man. And so if, if people see me doing all the carving on our shows, that's why. You just love to do it. I, I, I get it. that. I, well, when you're guiding, that's part of the, part of the gig. <laughs> and you might do, I mean, in Montana or whatever, do four animals a week sometimes more for yeah. 10 weeks out of the year and then you go somewhere else and i started adding it up and it's in the of animals that i've cut packed everything i mean it's in the thousands yeah so you get you get fairly fast sometimes it's hard for me to like not do it because i'm like okay it's <laughs> <laughs> right. so like yeah hold on we You're gonna hurt yourself. Yeah. yeah let me just get in there and do it this way yeah. you f figure out you do it enough times you figure out the easiest way to do things and you find some pretty fun little different ways to do stuff and yeah get to try new cutting techniques but yeah. i don't know yeah, well, for me, it's just part of what I grew up doing. And for my family, the care of the meat was as big of a part of the hunt as the hunt itself. It was like, this is where you really kind of had your uh, growth into acceptance among the uncles and the grandfathers in your, your hunting camp was how well you took care of it once you had it on the ground not just gutting it in the field, but when you got home, man, it was like, oh, you got a hair on that. And, you know, like you're going to get grounded for yeah. a week because you had a hair on a tenderloin or something. And it's like, but that, 
to me, that just keeps bringing me back to how I really got into hunting. My family hunted for food as much. I mean, yeah, it was a social and part of our culture, but food was a big part of it. And that was expressed in how much care they put into taking care of their their meat when the that's cool when the time came so but so you and your celebrity status uh are on a tight schedule and i'm really appreciative that you (laughs) my celebrity status (laughs) well i just saw the entourage showing up here i I mean yeah i I wish i would wear my boots it's getting deep in here (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but I, uh, so uh, who, who was your entourage this trip? Just your wife? Yep. Oh, just my wife. Well, I don't want to keep you from your wife because I kind of called you at the last minute and said, hey, I hear you're going to be in town. Can I borrow some of your time and be in the polite guy you are? You said, yeah, sure. No, I appreciate it because I think the first time we talked, said, oh, we should do a podcast was what? Very soon after you started the podcast, yeah, I think it was a shot ago. show or I something know. along like five, four, five, six. I don't even time yeah, flying now, but how yeah, long? But, and we never have been able to do it. So. No, so I'm glad we we finally got the chance to yeah. sit down and and chat. There's yeah. been a few times where I'm pretty sure we've passed each other on the highway in Nevada. And you know, you're like, oh, I was driving back from this area. I was like, oh, I'm actually headed out to this other area. We had to have crossed paths on this day yeah. at some point. I know. Well, what I'd like to do is the next time I'm in Nevada, I'm going to get you and Tim together. Oh, yeah, there the you podcast. go. That'd be cool. That'd be fun. Because it, it's always more fun when you have somebody there who can kind of keep the other person honest yeah, or push them in a few places that they know some insider info that makes for interesting conversations. Right. So I suspect secret if, stuff. if you and Tim were on together, it, it would probably result in some pretty good humor. I think so. Yeah, it'd be pretty fun. Uh, it's so, always a good time. But with your busy hunting schedules, I don't know. Yeah, uh, it's like lightning striking when me and Tim actually get together because <laughs> it happens three times a year probably. It's pretty rare. Well, I don't want to interfere with one of those three times yeah. in a year. It was, it was nice though. This this year he actually, uh, we got to go on a hunt together, which is the first time in, in probably eight years. Oh, wow. So that was kind of cool. We went uh, we went down to Mexico coos deer hunting. Ooh. And uh, that was a lot of fun. That was cool. Yeah, I didn't film my hunt or anything. I was just more of a my brother and uh, a couple friends of mine. It's just that one of those trips that we talked about for yeah. ever. And just decided, all right, let's go do it. Yeah, now's now's as good as any uh-huh. time. There's never a perfect time to do stuff like that. And no. you just kind of have to do it. Like the same group of guys, we've been saving up our Wyoming points to go on an antelope hunt, and it's like place we wanted to hunt needed two or three points and now we've all got seven we're like what's going on wait a second and you just time just gets too busy you just gotta do it you just, right. there's never gonna be a perfect year to line five people up to just go on a never hunt you just gotta you you just have to do it when it's yeah. it's kind of like a if somebody gives you a good bottle of whatever whiskey wine whatever don't put it on your shelf drink it that day because it's, <laughs> it's, it's not well at least with it's not any better than any of the other craps it just has a label on it. you just got to do it <laughs> otherwise it's going to sit there and never get drank and grit some dust on it and then your grandkids are going to have to drink some <laughs> bottle that's gone bad <laughs> just just jump in guys and go uh, for it that's that's remy's advice that's for this advice. podcast folks don't let your wine and whiskey get old yeah just, <laughs> no but i think you're point is well taken i just anymore and this is when you reach a certain age at what you just said there gets to be more and more relevant to your daily life uh i just put things on the calendar and say you know what it's on the calendar now i i'm gonna go do it i'll find a way to go do it yeah no matter what it is whether it's a trip to go see a family member or a a hunting trip or a fishing trip or if you put it on your calendar, you'll find a way to go do it. Yeah, that's what I, I think it happens a lot with people that want to hunt out west that haven't or want to go on their first elk hunt. They're like, oh, what do I need to do? One day I'd like to go on it. How do, yeah. I, you know, one day. Just honestly, everybody that's ever gone on it just did it. Don't, right. don't right. just go and go now. Don't wait because as a guide, you I get hunters and most 
or are used to, a lot of them were older and then they go on their first elk hunt and they go, you know what? I really wish I would have done this when I was 30. Really? Or, like, I, or I, I just really wish that I would have done it their whole life they worked and like, oh, I'll go on an elk hunt when I retire. Yeah. And then they go, you know, I could have made it work. I guarantee it. Yeah. And it just sucks that I waited so long. Yeah. I know. No, I, my slogan, my tagline and everything I write, and people have heard this, is hunt when you can because you're going to run out of health before you run out of money. And we're all, whether we admit it or not, we're on a path where our health is terminal. And we, we don't know when, but there's the, so far, the survival rate is zero in this thing we call life. Yeah. So every one of us have the sand draining out of our hourglass. And I, I'm not going to wait around. I'm going. Yeah, you just, you just have to pack up your things and do it. Uh, yeah. uh, that's kind of the way I've always been, even through high school, college, now. It's like, yeah, I, oh, yeah I'm a college student and I've work half the year as a hunting guy. I don't make a lot of money, but if there was a hunt that I wanted to do, I would just go on it. <laughs> just <laughs> figure it out. You can do things pretty cheap if you really have no... The tag is yeah. going to be the most expensive portion of yeah. it. That's the nice thing about public land is once you've got that tag, that's your cost, really. Right. You just have to... You're tagging gas and that's it. Yeah. and yeah. I don't count food because I eat when I'm at, eat whether I'm at home or whether I'm out in elk camp. I mean, yep. I got to eat. So that's not even part of my trip. Exactly. And the amount of gear I have now is almost cumbersome. So I tell people, don't worry about what gear you have. Just go. And over yeah. time, you'll accumulate what gear works or doesn't or get rid of what gear doesn't work for your hunting style. But right now, just go. Yeah, as long as you've got something to shoot and a tag yeah. and something on your feet, but you don't even have to have that. You'd be fine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Remy, thanks so much for your time. I know I'm I'm really imposing on you, and oh, I no, apologize I for it. that. I'm so, really glad uh, that uh, we could finally do this. We'll have to do, we'll have to yeah. do it another time, too, and maybe have another conversation in the future. Yeah, yeah I'd love to do it. Maybe what, you reached out to me about four or five years ago and said, Randy, if you're really interested in New Zealand on your own, I can show oh, you yeah. how to do it. And that was one of those, yeah, I'm going to do that someday. You just got to do it. You just, just go online. Here's when you just go online, The what's that, Cyber Monday deals, and just book a ticket because it's not <laughs> going to get any cheaper on that day. <laughs> just, just put it between uh, the months of March and June and you should be fine. Really? Yeah. Huh. I, as I heard you talk about that story, I'm like, now that was true adventure to show up with a one-way ticket. Oh, yeah. And say, I'm doing this for three months. That yeah, is, figure that it is out. cool. And you do. You, you, you really do figure it out. Yeah. I mean. Maybe my wife is going to buy me a one-way ticket. <laughs> yeah, I should talk to her. If I just sent her the email, she, you'd have been there. You'd probably still be there. <laughs> right. <laughs> Let me help you pack, honey. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, thanks so much, Remy. I really appreciate it, folks. Thanks for listening. Uh, again, if you want to follow Remy, uh, he's a really uh, prolific Instagrammer, at Remy Warren. Uh, and you can watch a lot of his content out on YouTube, The Solar Solo Hunter. Uh, I think Solo Hunter's now on Amazon like we are. Yep. And uh, and other than that, they can just follow you as you do your summer kind of like, you're, you're like Bruce Springsteen and the Eagles. And uh, I mean, you're going around just the go West doing up. signing autographs. <laughs> yeah. You're playing, are you singing today? Here uh, yeah, or? right. <laughs> <laughs> Modeling, There's singing. a few things I don't do. Singing's one of them. <laughs> uh, actually, Remy and Steve Rinella are doing an appearance here in Bozeman today. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go home, put on my real kind of casual clothes, and I'm gonna be back here. And I like I, I'm gonna ask for your autograph and, oh, a, yes. and, a, and a selfie picture. There it goes. Where are my boots at? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Nothing like a good old fashioned ridicule. Well, no. I gotta sweeten you up a little bit because exactly. I, I'm I'm. I, I'm just kind of setting you up for when I'm going to call in a favor and oh say, boy. Remy, I really need this favor, man. Can you tell me where this big red stag is down yep. in New Zealand? That's good. <laughs> I'll, I'll show you. 
<laughs> it depends on nice you are to me. There's some, there'll be that spot. Oh, it's over three ridges from where you park here. You'll walk over here and be like, I wonder where this road goes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, did you know that you were on our, you were the subject of conversation on our Alaska Black Bear podcast and our Alaska Black Bear hunt we just did? No, I didn't know that, but I did draw a spring bear tag. Did you? Uh, for ne- yeah, cause, so it's 2019. 19, yeah. I put it in, in 17. It's right. A weird, <laughs> it's a weird deal. Cool. Yeah. So one of our camera guys, Dan Wildy, when we're getting ready to go, he's like, well, if it's raining, wait until it's done raining because Remy Warren says that's when the bears come out. Yeah. I'm like, really? Remy lives in Nevada where it never rains. What, what does he know about exactly. bears coming out in the rain? <laughs> and uh, so the whole time we're up there, it's raining miserably. And uh, so we're joking back and forth. Well, if it quit raining, we could follow Remy's strategy and the bears would come the out. The bears would come out. And so my buddy Mike, he shot his bear in the worst torrential downpour. It was just terrible. And I'm like, well, so much for Remy Warren saying that the bears come out when it stops raining. It's still raining and the bears came out. And so you're, uh, you, you were uh, kind of the subject of that. That's th- funny. That humor. So ap- apologies in, in arrears, not in advance. Oh, yeah. No, that's okay. You know, yeah, actually, you either... At least in Montana, once it starts raining, the bears do come out. Yeah. And then when it stops, even more bears come out. Yeah. It's, uh, so when we got back, we asked Dan, we're like, where can, we've been listening. We can't find where Remy ever said that. And so Dan went back, I think it was on the Solo Hunter YouTube channel, and found where you had said something about, oh, quit raining. That's usually a good time for the bears to come out. <laughs> so he, I, I told him, I said, Remy's going to call me and chew me out and say, like, when did I ever say well, that? It's good that you said that because I actually was trying to think, I don't remember everything. That <laughs> <laughs> so Dan showed it to me. Yeah. It's actually there. That's He's good. like, really? I didn't make it up. I'm like, okay, Dan, calm down. We, I, I get it. So anyhow, if someone, I'm going to have to take my own advice now. Yeah. So if someone comes up to you and says, hey, I watched Newberg's thing. You're right. The bears do. Because I shot mine right after the rain, right, the rain comes up. Yeah. yeah. So up. That, that's kind of. You it, know, it's it, funny though, because the last three bears I've got in Montana have all been right after the rain stopped. Oh, really? It's, it's like one of those where it rains for three days. Mm-hmm. And then right when it stops, this is like I've shot I've, the last three years in a row. I've shot my bears right after a rainstorm. <laughs> good, cool. good advice. I guess I, I was on to something. <laughs> See, you didn't even know you were giving didn't out such good advice, good, Remy. Good advice. So, anyhow, I, I needed to apologize for, for that. Uh, uh, apology not accepted. <laughs> all, right. <laughs> uh, all right, folks. Uh, thanks for listening. Go and check out Remy. Follow him on all of his platforms, and uh, we'll catch up with you in a couple weeks.